Good evening. Hello, and I, I'd like to welcome everybody in the room and all of the people who are joining us online tonight as well. My name is Eileen Fuchs. I'm the president and executive director of the National Building Museum. And I can't think of a better way to spend World Architecture Day, today's World Architecture Day, yes, okay, okay, than at the National Building Museum awarding the Vincent Scully Prize. So welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening in honor of Dolores Hayden, our 2022 winner of the Vincent Scully Prize. This prize, established in 1999, recognizes exemplary achievements in the built environment. Named for the esteemed Sterling Professor Emeritus of the History of Art at Yale University and distinguished visiting professor at the University of Miami, Vincent Scully, the prize recognizes excellence in practice, scholarship, or criticism in architecture, history, preservation, and urban design. The nomination and selection process for each year's recipient it resides within our esteemed jury, who this year includes Ellen Dunham Jones, James Corner, Walter Hood, and Elizabeth Platter Zyberk. I also want to acknowledge David M. Schwartz, who is one of the driving forces behind the Vincent Scully Prize, who's here with us this evening. And I want to acknowledge our esteemed board of directors and trustees, if you could just wave, um, who continue to give us such energy and leadership. Thank you so, so much. So we will now hear from jury member Walter Hood, the creative director and founder of Hood Design Studio and professor of landscape architecture, environmental planning, and urban design at the University of California, Berkeley. Although he could not be here in person tonight, he did not want to miss the chance to introduce Dolores. So let's take a look. Good evening. On Tuesday, June 28th, the Vincent Scully Prize jury, Ellen Durnham Jones, chair, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, James Corner, Paul Goldberger, and myself, we met via Zoom to deliberate on nominations for the 2022 Vincent Scully Prize. Ellen Durnham Jones put forth Dolores Hayden as a strong candidate. The jury voted unanimously to nominate Hayden based on the following justification. Hayden's work as an architect and historian is particularly influenced by its early and impactful attention to the influence of feminism, ethnicity, and regulations on places. Her many books continue Scully's fascination with American architecture and urbanism and has been highly influential. Hayden's first book, The Grand Domestic Revolution, remains the canonical text of how early material feminists and suffrage invented and produced new housing forms in the late 19th and 20th century. Her second book, Redesigning the American Dream, was a revelation that is still powerfully relevant today. Hayden's attention to both economic development policy and the landscapes it produced significantly helped empower the new urbanist movement to take on the world of land use regulations. Like Scully in many ways, Hayden has been an impactful scholar with a voice that remains very powerful. Dolores Hayden writes about politics of place. As an urban historian and architect, her interests span architecture, urban planning, and cultural history as well as gender studies. Beginning in the 1970s, she pioneered the analysis of American built environments to document the history of gender, class, and race. And personally for me, Dolores' work has had a major impact on my work in my studio and my pedagogical research. Her founding of a nonprofit in the 1980s to celebrate the labor of women, men, and children of all ethnic backgrounds in downtown Los Angeles. The power of place, urban landscapes as public history documents that work. I can remember the first time I saw the Biddy Mason project. Walking through downtown Los Angeles in an alley, I came upon a wall with a figure, a half portrait of an African-American midwife. And it told her story in the late 19th and early 20th century. This book and work has influenced a generation of artists, pioneers, and architects and designers giving ideation to the discourse and phenomenology. As social practices and cultural practices and communities searches and highlights other voices in the public realm, this book has been the foundation. It has been the origin. A graduate of Mount Holyoke College and the Harvard GSD, Hayden has taught at UC Berkeley, MIT, UCLA, Yale, where she was professor of architecture, urbanism, and American studies until her retirement in 2017. 
She has been the recipient of many different research grants, including the NEH, the NEA, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute, the Lincoln Institute, to name a few. Her books and articles have been translated in a dozen languages. She's also a poet, and her most recent collection, Exuberance, engages the voices of female and male stunt pilots from the early years of American aviation. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce the 2022 Vincent Scully Prize to Dolores Hayden. Thank you. Okay, and on behalf of the National Building Museum, I am now going to present the Vincent Scully Prize to Dolores. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. She will now hold this bowl during her entire presentation. <laughs> no, we, won't do, we won't do that to you. Dolores. Thank you to the National Building Museum for awarding me the 2022 Vincent Scully Prize. I am delighted. Thank you to Ellen Dunham Jones as chair of the jury. Thank you to Walter Hood for my introduction, and thank you to all the other members of the jury who selected me. As an urban historian and architect, I've written about the politics of place, and discussion enlivens a writer's life. I'd like to thank, first of all, my husband and daughter, Peter Maris and Laura Maris, both writers as well. I'm grateful for outstanding colleagues and students at the four universities where I taught for over four decades before my retirement in 2017. And a special thanks to those of you who are here tonight. I'd also like to thank readers everywhere and my publishers at MIT Press, W.W. W. Norton and Pantheon, and the translators who carried my work into many languages around the world. Back in the late 1960s, at a time when race riots tore apart American cities, I enrolled as a graduate student in architecture at Harvard. The faculty didn't convey to us how inequality had scarred this country. So decades later, I appreciate the thousands of colleagues everywhere who incorporate gender, race, and class as intersecting subjects for inclusive research and practice. Many of you know The Power of Place, the nonprofit I established in LA in the 1980s to create a downtown itinerary honoring women, men, and children in the labor force from the city's founding. People of diverse ethnic backgrounds worked in the vineyards, the citrus groves, the flower fields, truck farms, the downtown oil field, garment factories, and prefabricated housing factories. I wanted everyone living in Los Angeles to know that it was the labor of those groups that built downtown, not the men whose names were on 98% of LA historic landmarks back then. Times have changed. But the desire to make public space more welcoming and private space less isolating runs through all my work. Tonight, I'm going to speak very briefly. Then I'm going to engage with Ellen Jones in an extended conversation, and then there will be Q&A with the audience, both the live audience and the audience on Zoom. The title of my brief talk is Domestic Revolutions, Spaces of Care, Then and Now. Housing and urban infrastructure were controversial topics in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
part of broad debates about how to define public and private life in urban industrial societies. At the center is the labor of social reproduction, the everyday nurturing of children and the elderly as well as other adults, often called care work, is nurturing recognized and supported as work, or is it taken for granted until it is missing? The pandemic has foregrounded these questions in the last two years, but they were the subject of my 1981 book, A Grand Domestic Revolution. I'd like to tell you just a small bit about my research and update it for 2022. A century and a half ago, some women in the suffrage movement campaigned to reshape cities and suburbs to support gender equality. They, trend, they, they challenged the Victorian double standard that men could go everywhere while respectable women were supposed to stay home caring for their families. Because these activists challenged the spatial and economic constraints of women's domestic sphere, I called them material feminists. They believed the vote was not enough. They argued the built environment had to change to support women's unpaid nurturing work and allow women greater access to public life. Well, at that time, urban infrastructure meant water supply, sewers, paved streets, and public transportation. But the material feminists proposed much broader infrastructure they established child care centers. They organized food delivery services with horse-drawn wagons. And one of my favorite experiments in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was a producer's cooperative for cooking, laundry, and mending. Wives presented the cooked food and clean clothing to husbands for cash on delivery. There were other experiments. A woman scientist designed and built public kitchens like MIT labs to supply nutritious food in poor neighborhoods. A writer promoted a feminist apartment hotel with childcare in Greenwich Village. A philosopher created a work-life curriculum for students at a women's college as well as childcare for the faculty. These experiments surprised me with evidence to expand both urban history and women's history. Now, at the time I did the research, my husband and I did not have children yet, so I didn't know how demanding parenting would be. But later, if I'd been able to move our family into an apartment hotel with childcare, I suspect we would have tried it. The material feminists' projects still sound very contemporary and some continued through World War II. Yet these experiments vanished when Rosie the Riveter was laid off and wartime childcare centers shut down. Nurturing work became invisible again in the post-war suburbs. In redesigning the American dream, I explored how stereotypes about woman's place, as well as place based on class and race, were embedded in millions of post-war single-family houses, most of them located in segregated subdivisions. White male household, white male-headed households benefited from federal mortgage subsidies. Households headed by women and people of color did not get these opportunities. Some of us proposed modifying suburban tracks to accommodate smaller households and varied household types. We proposed improving public transportation and adding childcare since more and more mothers were in paid employment. But as you all know, the US moved in the opposite direction. Right-wing politicians tied dream houses to so-called family values. In 1971, Nixon vetoed a popular bipartisan child care bill. And after 1972, Phyllis Schlafly defeated the ERA. The dream houses got bigger and bigger, though households got smaller. My next book on suburbs, Building Suburbia, Greenfields and Urban Growth, 
distinguish older patterns of suburbanization from federally subsidized sprawl. Many kinds of suburbs existed before 1945, but after that, federal subsidies for mortgages, for interstate highways, and for greenfield commercial projects on raw land combined to produce automobile-oriented sprawl. The greenfield subsidies, which are much less known, provided windfalls for developers of malls, big box stores, and fast food chains through accelerated depreciation. And all these suburban commercial projects came to dominate the national landscape, eroding many cities and small towns. Although the U.S. subsidized sprawl, politicians in Washington have continued to reject care infrastructure as too expensive. They've rejected paid maternity and paternity leave. They've rejected a national child care program over and over, and they've refused to pass a Bill of Rights for professional care workers. Unpaid family care, two-thirds of it by women, has been the default. I. Jen Pu defines care as the work that makes all other work possible. She leads the National Domestic Workers Alliance of housekeepers, nannies, and home care workers for the elderly, many of them women of color and recent immigrants whose jobs do not often pay enough to support their own families. Unlike the USA, most European democracies have established policies supporting childcare and paid parental leave, as well as the right to housing and health care. In 1994, the European Charter for Women in the City made equality explicit. Abolish stereotypes. Daily life as seen through a woman's eyes must become a political issue. In the European Union, gender impact assessment, that is the evaluation of all government spending in terms of gender equity, has reoriented transportation budgets away from highways for male commuters and toward public transport for female care workers with more complex itineraries. Gender mainstreaming programs like those run in Vienna by Eva Kyle resulted in the Frauen Werkstatt, Women Work City, and two more housing complexes, including over 500 units with services to support women. Vienna also made city streets safer for women at night. They redesigned parks and playgrounds to support girls and provide them with more space to balance soccer fields and other playing fields claimed mostly by boys. In one new urban development, they named all the streets for women to complement the rest of the city. They aim for fair shared cities. Spanish architect Inez Sanchez de Madariaga is the editor of the book Fair Shared Cities, and she advocates urban design for all citizens, women, men, non-binary people, children as well as the elderly, and people with disabilities. Her phrase for this is an urbanism of care. She wants to provide better conditions, and this is a quote, better conditions for the realization of care tasks in the city, regardless of who in fact accomplishes them, whether this is individual men or women. And here's another example of infrastructure. In Bogota, Colombia, the city's Department of Women, under Mayor Claudia Lopez, established 11 care blocks. These centers offer laundries, elder care, child care, classes, and counseling in a program described as feminist urbanism to support tens of thousands of women who provide caring labor to others. Lopez wants to eliminate not just income poverty, but also time poverty. Life never slows down. And so, back in the USA, during the pandemic, conflict over care work became more visible. 
Caring responsibilities collided in space and time. Picture a father working from home at the dining room table, trying to supervise his daughter's schooling while keeping an eye on the baby asleep in the crib. Imagine a mother retreating to a walk-in closet for a Zoom meeting, only to find her seven-year-old doing acrobatics there. Visualize an isolated elderly person or a helper overwhelmed with extra shifts, and chaos increased as soon as anyone got COVID. Well, some states and cities responded. New Mexico established free childcare for one year. Hawaii created Kapuna caregivers, financial support for employed people who are also caregivers of the elderly at home. Four dozen mayors launched pilot projects to stabilize family finances. But on a national level, legislation for care infrastructure stalled and the child tax credit expired. In the meantime, some architects and planners are asking their students to imagine more complex infrastructure for American cities and suburbs. Of course, the issue of care stretches far beyond architecture and urban planning. But these studios recognize that the built environment can be an obstacle to change or it can be a support. I've met with studios entitled Lost Commons, Extended Domesticity, Spatial Divisions of Gender in the Post-COVID World, Complete Houses, and Designing the Non-Sextist Suburb. In all of these groups, students rethink stereotypes of the family, re-examine private and public domains, and design new kinds of housing and infrastructure. So, in conclusion, as the urbanism of care gains ground in Europe, I'm wondering if Americans will once again be as inventive as the material feminists who proposed a grand domestic revolution. Their projects from a century ago prefigured the European Charter, rediscover the city through women's eyes. Perhaps voters, especially women voters, will demand gender impact analysis here. Perhaps we will analyze the benefits of electric cars, solar equipment, wind equipment and chips, which have all already passed, as you know, and make a comparison to care infrastructure. Perhaps, perhaps we will create the fair shared city and valorize care in order to plan for the work that makes all other work possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dolores, for sharing your insight. I, I would just share on a, a personal note, The Power of Place was the first required reading in my first semester of graduate school and had a profound effect on me, and it's just an honor to hear you speak here tonight. And with that, I would like to now um, in introduce the chair of the Scully Prize jury, Ellen Dunham-Jones, who will join Dolores in conversation about her work. So Professor Ellen Dunham-Jones is director of the MS in Urban Design and host of the Redesigning Cities podcast at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She is co-author with June Williamson of the award-winning Retrofitting Suburbia book series, and her work has been featured in prominent media, including the New York Times, TED, and NPR. Welcome, Ellen. Well, wow. Dolores, that was fabulous. I, I really just want you to keep talking. I don't know that I need to ask questions um, <laughs> to try to, to lead a conversation. That was really, I think, just so insightful. Um, and I also want to just say congratulations. Thank you. I could Thank not you. be more delighted that you, you are the Scully Thank Prize you. winner. Thank you. And I want to let the audience know that you've recently received another major international prize. Uh, you seem to be ever more in the public eye. 
And so I'd like to ask you to reflect a, a bit on why now? And you kind of hinted hmm. at it in the talk. And I want to preface that question with just a bit more background for the audience. I mean, in 1981, you were the first historian to unearth the work of the material feminists. Uh, to free, you know, what were their various experiments to tr and, and bringing those to light. Then in the 80s, you founded and wrote The Power of Place, uh, you know, uh, produced The Power of Place, wrote the book to honor the laborers in Los Angeles. Then you started your documentation of suburbia and the re-entrenchment of women as unpaid home workers, homemakers. These works and the issue of infrastructure of caring, I think have continued, they've always, they've continued to attract an audience. Your, your works are read, it was great to hear. Eileen read it while she was in grad school. I mean, we, um, but it seems to me almost that you're getting more international recognition now. I mean, there's always been a stream, but you're, you're hot. You're hot right now. <laughs> Um, is it because of the pandemic? Is it because suburbia since the pandemic is kind of having a moment? Is it an abortion rights reawakened feminism? What is triggering so much overdue attention to the invisibility of caring? Well, I think it is unusual for someone who has been retired for seven years to have found that the phone was ringing and the uh, <laughs> emails were arriving and the Zooms were happening during the pandemic. So I, I think it's very clear that people understood the complexity of home and the work going on there when they were forced to do paid work at home as well as all of the nurturing work that would normally be there. And yet, I'm not sure that the pandemic is the only thing that has um, aroused uh, some interest in the history of the grand domestic revolution. I believe that history was always there. And in fact, when the book came out, I think there were 50 or 60 reviews of the book. Um, there were many, many people in either urban history or women's history fascinated by this. And uh, perhaps not so much in architecture. So I've had a very multidisciplinary career. I've been a professor of urban planning. I've been... Um, a professor of architecture and urbanism and American studies, and I've also at different times um, connected into programs of landscape architecture, and uh, I had a fellowship at the um, at CASBIS at Stanford, which is basically a social science research institute. So I've been very lucky to have a wide set of funders, and there surely were people who believed that all of this work, essential, necessary work, which was never included in gross domestic product, had to be accounted for in some way. And it couldn't just be invisible. It couldn't be written off. And the pandemic certainly made things visible when people tried to connect with other folks on Skype or on, on Zooms, and you know, then suddenly, the children are running across the background or the, uh, the, the general sense is chaos and instability. And we all heard, of course, probably we read the stories. I read them in the Boston Globe and the New York Times about the women who went out in groups for the primal scream. Did any of you see those? And they're out at night just screaming because they were so frustrated uh, at the collisions of, of necessary work in the house and paid labor. And of course, some women were, in one way or another, pressured to leave their careers in order to try to keep things uh, stable. And that they're, they're, they, if, they learn, if they 
earned less than their husbands, perhaps the husbands were the ones who got to continue with paid work. And so we've read these stories, but most of them not in the context of how the built environment was reinforcing all of these uh, stereotypes about whose work was important and what counted, what, what, what it meant to be in the economy of paid work versus what it meant to be doing the unpaid work. And of course the care workers complicate that picture greatly because they're called in to support the women who are trying to do their unpaid nurturing and can't manage to be in two or three places at once. Now, if you think about how many issues were modeled for years by people who were in architecture and planning, the models generally said that the family consisted of the man who was head of the household, the housewife and mother and the children, and that that was what all housing should be designed for, and therefore you needed two or three bedroom houses, and pretty soon the whole economy was rated on how many of those houses were being produced every year, housing starts. Then, at the same time, uh, the transportation modeling was based on men needing to get to work as commuters, not on the women who had to, first of all, take the kids to school, take the, uh, car to the supermarket to do the shopping, take a child to a pediatrician, then go to the pay a job, and then come home and do all of those others again. And when you began to look at those things, it was clear that there needed to be much more public transit, much more support for pedestrians. And yet these issues were fought over decades. And a lot of the people doing the modeling really didn't see any reason uh, to make women less invisible. They, they had their priorities, and their priorities were based on their own life experience. So what's happened in Europe with the gender impact assessment is that you can no longer model things that way. And it's come with a huge you know, wave of saying, so let's get that data right. Please get the data right. And then we can maybe think about making more sensible decisions. Well, I wasn't going to jump into suburbia right away just because that's clearly that's also where most of my research is on retrofitting suburbia but you've you've brought us there so I'm going to go ahead and, and follow that line I mean to this day I am really astonished that so many working women will put up with let alone seek out a single family house in a subdivision that the model of which was absolutely based on a stay-at-home wife and not this, not the dual shift uh, work woman who's also doing paid labor outside of the house. So, the, you know, and it doesn't, we know, it just, that model doesn't work very well for the dual income households, let alone for the kids. Talk a little about how much demographics have really changed and the new we have we we're seeing new housing types emerging you know, a little not, yes uh, certainly not well, dominant single people are now the largest demographic group in suburbs and so that means a combination of young single people and older single people and the um, male headed family with the wife and kids is a smaller proportion, we're seeing more single parent families and um, more single people or more people without kids, maybe couples without kids. So yes, it's all changed. And yet, we haven't yet truly thought about what kinds of other dwelling arrangements would be more yeah. engaging, more fun, more satisfactory. So, you know, in a certain respect, I, I, I'm, you pointed out, and it, I agree with you, you know, that the decision makers back when were mostly male, where the only thing that mattered was you needed highways because that's the male commute trip is the most important trip in the world and nothing else really, women aren't supposed to leave the house. Um, and that, but, and I'm sort of flipping it a little bit back to actually the, the consumers, um, the women who are often picking the house still not recognizing the disconnect um, of, of what they're seeing. But 
Yeah, we are seeing more accessory dwelling units, often called the granny yes. flats. Yes. We're seeing cottage courts or sort of, you know, groupings of bungalows around a shared green. Do you see those examples facilitating sharing and caring? Or are they kind of further entrenching some of the, what do you, what do you think about those new models? Well, all these issues are very delicate negotiations. And I am not an advocate of communal living. I think that people choose their households, they choose their friends, they live their lives. People want, a multi want opportunities for connections, but they don't want connections forced upon them. You know, if, suppose I said, you know, we're all going to move into the National Building Museum and uh, we'll cook together in the uh, atrium. Everybody here would be pretty appalled. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a new housing type, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't really be ready for it, nor would it be a good idea. So you have, to, you have to find a way to balance privacy and community. You have to find a way to uh, encourage participation without uh, demanding it. And that's why I think one should imagine a care infrastructure that supports the choices. And that's what it seems like the Europeans have been working to do. And Americans, for whatever reasons, uh, haven't yet understood that it is so very wrong to keep on rejecting all this legislation which would make care work more recognized and more supported. And yes. <laughs> so, so it shouldn't be invisible. Yeah. How, and how should we define unpaid caring work? Well, I think that the care workers, if they begin a program, they ask everyone to turn to the person next to them and describe someone who has cared for them. And people exchange this. And so it could be a mother, it could be a grandmother, it could be a father, a grandfather. It could be an uncle and aunt, it could be a nanny, but then one is talking very personally. And care is there from birth through adulthood to death. It's very uh, significant kind of hands-on work that often um, needs to be done with great, great skill and integrity. Mm -hmm. And when it's done, it's often invisible and ignored. And when it's not done, or when the pandemic creates collisions, then somehow, suddenly, everyone notices that, yes, we do need to eat several meals a day, and uh, people need clean clothes. And yet, during the pandemic, I don't know of any group of women who ever delivered the clean clothes and the cooked food to their husbands for cash on delivery the way they, the way they did in 1969, 1869, sorry, in uh, Cambridge, Mass. <laughs> So are men today, are men sharing more of that unpaid cared work? What, what do we know? Well, I looked to see some numbers. And of course, these numbers uh, may not be absolutely accurate. And if you talk about a national average, it's only that average. But what I read was women do 28 hours a week on the average in the US in unpaid care work and men do uh, 15. And so on a daily basis, women are doing about four hours a day. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, it, it seems to me, we have these, we, we talk about feminism in, its wa in the waves, right? All these, right. it keeps evolving. It certainly does. So it seems to me, and I, maybe it's just the bias of my own time in that cycle, but that each generation of women, when they're young women, they, they tend to feel that progress is being made bit by bit. Um, and it's only as we get older that we get angry. Uh, we, we realize, no, it hasn't changed enough. Uh, but I think when you know, younger uh, women tend to feel that the future is just going to continue to get brighter for them. And there's more and more equality. Yet I will say, when I read your work on how these experiments in equality established by the material feminists or the company towns that were built for Rosie the Riveter with 
24-hour daycare, 24-hour kitchens. Um, and, and then they were dismantled. I, mean, I was really shocked at how far mm -hmm. we have slid back. So well, tell us a bit so more world, about why and when the work of both it, of these groups didn't really in, stick. In World War II, women were valued workers. They were recruited for those industrial jobs, and they understood they couldn't just abandon their children. So yes, there was a need for a 24-hour childcare center if you had three shifts in your shipyard. And the women didn't have time to cook after eight hours of welding, so they made food for them to take home when they picked up the children. It's perfectly reasonable to value women workers. The only problem was they weren't valued consistently, and when the war was over, they were expected to immediately become uh, unpaid housewives or take jobs of a very different kind. Say, maybe they become supermarket checkout cashiers or something, but the unions didn't keep them on as skilled workers and the employers didn't keep them on. It was just assumed that they had to be pushed to the side, whatever their status. And surely some of them were single and some of them were widows and some of them had to support children. So it, it was a time when there should have been a very intense uh, effort on behalf of all those women to find a new way to think about the workforce and recognize the workforce. But that didn't happen. And then I think when feminism developed in the 60s and 70s, there wasn't enough serious, thoughtful attention given to the economic value of nurturing work and the importance of nurturing work and the skills involved with it. And so, as women began to knock on the doors of medical schools and law schools and architecture schools and say, I would like to uh, gain these skills, feminism was identified with women wanting more choices and being uh, able to join men in those professions in an equal way. And it really, provided an opportunity for someone like Phyllis Schlafly to organize housewives on behalf of conservative, hyper-conservative causes because she was a strong anti-communist and uh, a very right-wing Republican and she was also working with all these religious leaders to deny us the Equal Rights Amendment. And what happened there, I think, was that some housewives didn't feel their skills and time were respected until someone like Shafley said, yes, of course you're doing all this socially necessary work. And she actually did think hard about what it would take to give housewives more respect. And most feminists didn't think of anti-feminism at that time as a countervailing force, although certainly we've seen as time has moved to 2022 that the seeds of some of our current difficulties uh, go all the way back to that fight against the ERA, the recruiting of those religious leaders who loved the male-headed family and distrusted women, and the recruiting of those religious leaders around abortion against gay rights, and uh, the way in which housework was kind of a third part of that campaign. And as Schleifle moved through her life, the, I'm sure some of you know the last thing she did uh, was to write a book called The Conservative Case for Trump. And she endorsed him very strongly. And we all know that many, many uh, women did vote the way she suggested. So I think we need to reevaluate many of these different strains in feminism over half a century mm -hmm. and longer, and then think much harder about how we understand the necessary work, the work that makes all other work possible. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think I love that phrase. I do too. And I, but I also really love your phrase, make public spaces more welcoming and private space less isolating. 
and I think it's all, you know, on the subject of politics and the built environment and the pa development patterns, I mean, it's so interesting to see the red and the, the, the red countryside, the blue cities, and suddenly the purple suburbs, the battleground for so many of these ideas playing out. And in some respects, I think what we're seeing are the, the suburbs that are making their public spaces more welcoming and their private spaces less isolating tend to be the, those that are vote, tending to vote more like the cities. Um, do, are, you, what well, is, are you seeing some of those kinds of things really, playing out? You are really the person who knows the most about retrofitting suburbs and making uh, spaces more welcoming and less isolated. Thinking about mixed use, combining residence with commercial, thinking about uh, pedestrian access, sidewalks, limiting traffic, making those places that everyone would like to be in. And yet, it's very hard work. And in this country, I do believe we sent most of the subsidies in the wrong direction. Yeah. Especially all those greenfield commercial suburban projects. It's going to be a here. long time before we can fix any of that. So the question then is, do we just need the government to switch the subsidies now to be more in favor <laughs> of mixed use? Do we need the Build Back Better bonds to go more into caring and care infrastructure? I mean, is the answer change government policy? Or is the answer See, uh, government, we, we don't want the government kind of getting, dictating where and how, those sub, how, how our built environment is really playing out. Well, I believe the government has dictated, and the real estate lobby, together, the developers of real estate have dictated with the government subsidies just how this landscape has been shaped, and that it is not a happy realization to see the ways that things were misunderstood and things were corrupted. And I don't think the simple answer is that the federal government could fix everything. But what I do see happening is that individual cities and states have a better feel for what is needed and that we still find that people in the House and the Senate are not voting for the kinds of supports for all Americans that would, to my mind, be the common sense way to go. There are only something like six countries in the world that don't have paid parental leave for men and women, and truly, you know, you don't want to be on that list, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we are. And paid parental leave, paid medical leave to take care of oneself or, or a close relative, someone who is dying. The ways in which ordinary human existence can be eased and supported by the understanding that this is life and that it is, it is something that needs, needs to work for everyone in order for larger organizations to be able to function. All the individuals really need as much support as possible. And I do think that so many countries have figured this out. And when I see that a lot of the current bills that have passed are about technology and environmental technology and maybe quite positive, but they are not about the details of people's everyday lives and the ways in which the structures we build to house ourselves and connect ourselves are, are lacking. And so, yes, uh, many of us can't want to make public life more welcoming and private life less isolated. And many of us work on those issues. I see a lot of people in the audience nodding, yes, yes. But it's a very, yeah. it's a very complicated political task. Well, and you did an, a rather extraordinary thing. Certainly, not many architects or historians have started nonprofits. So, tell us a little about what inspired you to start an, a nonprofit, and, and should everyone do this? 
Well, I'd written three successful books, and I had a desire to do something that was much more physical and spatial in Los Angeles, which was a city I had moved to uh, from spending the rest of my life on the East Coast or in the Northeast. And I had many graduate students at UCLA who were first generation uh, college students, and they wanted to be able to bring something back to their own neighborhoods, something very tangible and immediate. And I thought about what it meant to do preservation in Los Angeles, and architectural preservation was going to be about buildings by famous architects or buildings that represented very, uh, very wealthy people. And when I considered this more carefully as a new person to Los Angeles, it seemed one could do an itinerary in and around downtown about the labor force, which was particular to Los Angeles because there are not too many other cities that had flower fields and uh, produce markets right, right there in the downtown and an oil field. And I began doing this research and I was truly fascinated with what I found. The oil field originally had 2,500 small producers with pumps in their own yards cranking away. And I believe I walked around that area and most of it had been changed and the scale had changed. But sure enough, I did find one old pump with an orange crate with some stones as a counterweight. And there was just, just barely enough of the physical trace of the old Los Angeles to find the images and, the, and then do the research to establish that economic history of the city and tie it to the labor force. And I wanted especially to honor women of all ethnic backgrounds in that labor force. And I found children, too, working in the flower fields and the produce markets. Uh, and from that, the uh, project grew beyond mapping and communicating about the history of LA to uh, thinking about designating new landmarks and then involving artists in projects that would uh, celebrate different aspects of the city's history. And I think that it took off. It was the right time and the right place. It would have been hard to do that project in some eastern cities that were very divided between, say, um, different ethnic groups that held different territory. But LA was a very large city, a rapidly growing city, and immigrants from all over the world were there. But the major groups that had been in these different industries uh, were ready to take on their own history. Many groups had their own private organizations, but there was nothing that pulled them all together. And I was also able to recruit all the ethnic study programs at uh, UCLA as partners in this effort. And the School of Architecture and Urban Planning uh, gave me space after a while to begin to extend this. And many students uh, started their careers there. So it was a very, very rewarding experience. And then you may say, OK, so why aren't you still there? And the answer is that because I loved the discovery of scholarship, I loved teaching, and I was uh, forced to do a great deal of fundraising to make the power of place work. And I did it, I did it but I, I wasn't um, adept at it. And I realized that after maybe 10 or 12 years that I was going to have to make a very hard choice. And I could go back to teaching and writing or I would, um, I would be leading an organization and as fundraising. And I actually wanted to do the projects myself that I felt were most exciting. And I think that was the right choice. Although, it was, although there was one other thing that happened that I should reveal to you. And this is the, the magic of life, really. I did the project on Biddy Mason, who was an African-American midwife who was 
uh, brought to LA as enslaved by a Mormon master with 13 other slaves, and she fought for her freedom in the courts, won the suit, and became the city's most famous midwife. And while I was doing this project, after some years of trying, I became pregnant. And so I did have a child, a wonderful, joyous experience. And this was also part of my decision that fundraising, plus scholarship, plus running a nonprofit, uh, and being a professor, and being a mother. And, and um, I have to say, too, that I did this work for a decade pro bono while I had another full-time job, although I raised the grant money to pay every artist and historian who worked on these projects. So if anybody ever starts a nonprofit, please be sure that you recognize your own labor and don't turn out to be the pro bono person who uh, is paying everyone else, because that's just exhausting. But I was, I was very idealistic and very excited. And, and then suddenly, you know, I realized that there were going to be some very yeah. tough life choices there. Well, that, oh, that's wonderful to, to hear that. I, now, the other uh, not typical thing for architects and professors and historians to do is to write poetry. <laughs> so I would wonder if, I want to close by asking you about your, cur your current work, writing poetry, and how it connects or doesn't to your training as an architect and a historian. Have you always written poems? How did you get started? And do you think your poems reflect your architect's eye? When I was 18 or 19, I took a wonderful course at Mount Holyoke College with Robert Fitzgerald. And I decided at that moment I wanted to be a poet, but I didn't think that I could earn a living. And so I turned to architecture and then eventually to urban planning and urban history as more practical ways to earn a living. But I never stopped wanting to be a poet. And after many of the uh, books that I'd written and grants that I'd written were all successful. I decided I would dedicate one afternoon a week to being a poet. And that was back in 19, I think I published my first poem in 1983. So I've been at this for a long time. And, and I'm quite serious about it. And it is writing in a very different voice. And if I read you a poem about my commute, I think you'll hear it immediately. This one appeared in the uh, Yale Review some years back. In the middle lane, leaving New Haven. Dust covers behind the billboard. We want your scrap gold. Behind the imported oil on the tank farm, the rusting metal on the export pier, the oversized flags on the auto dealer's lot. Four out of five commuters drive alone. In the left lane, a black bus, shrink-wrapped with characters for luck, hurtled past me toward the casino. On the right, a white limo accelerates to a wedding. Side by side, we surge past the hill, level for a mall. Who is the risk-taker looking for grace? A cell tower marks frolic talk as I exit toward narrow roads that wind and rise and fall. I steer into the shapes of time, River Street, Water Street, curve with fishermen's work. Leeds Island Road weaves where farmers grew salt hay, and the last of the light fades on bone-colored Spartana. Who is the survivor mapping history? On Colonial Road, a developer has been clearing for new houses. Dispossessed, a doe and a buck wander onto the asphalt. Pay attention. Breaking hard, headlights high, I hear an owl. I might as well be an owl, hooting at the ice, lecturing the winter. Snow coats the sand on the beach. Snow drifts over the seawall next to the sound. On Cove Lane, my house resists the January wind, windows dark. My house is as cold as only a widow's can be. On the porch, shovel, rock salt, 
firewood. So you can hear the, thank you. I know you can hear the highway and the mall, but it's a very different, a very much more particular language. And I'm sure my training as an architect made me very alert to metrical poetry, the patterning of words, the patterning of time. Now that wasn't a metrical poem, but I could also read a little more from my book, Exuberance, if we have time. Absolutely. And that's the book about the stunt pilots. And this um, was a research project, unlike any other poetry that I've done, because I thought I might write a, a book about risk and the Great Depression, poems about that. And then I discovered that the language used to describe the Great Depression, crashes and tailspins, all came from the flyers of the 1920s, the barnstormers who were the first people to show off airplanes to Americans who'd never seen airplanes. So I thought I'd better read a little bit about the barnstormers in order to understand why Wall Street stole their language. And then in the end, the barnstormers were so fascinating to me. And there were women as well as men, many pilots, uh, so here's one in the voice of a flying instructor, flying lesson. Focus on the shapes. Cirrus a curl, stratus a layer, cumulus a heap. Humulus a small cloud. Cumulus, humulus, a fine day to fly. Incus the anvil, stay grounded. Nimbus rain, be careful. Don't take off near nimbus stratus. A shapeless layer of rain, hail, ice, or snow. Ice weighs on the blades of your propeller, weighs on the entering edge of your wings. Read a cloud, decode it. Watch for clouds closing under you. The sky opens in a breath, shuts in a heartbeat. And these. One more? Go one for more. it. Maybe the one about the, uh, the title poem is called Exuberance. Exuberance sips bootleg gin from a garter flask with a ruby monogram, E. She wears a red dress one size too small, eyes wide, she flirts with everyone. There's Lincoln Beachy to run his tank dry, ride a dead stick all the way down. She watches Ormer Locklear climb out of the cockpit 200 feet up, tap dance on his upper wing as the houses of honest families with their square fenced yards slide below his shuffle. An oval pond winks in the sun like a zero. Exuberance is a show off like Ruth Law. She speaks French like Bessie Coleman. These aviators predict Every American will fly. Exuberance believes everybody ought to be rich. She gets stock tips from her manicurist, call loans from her broker, orders shares in investment trusts. Why not? This nation is all about growth. Look at the skyscrapers shooting up. Men rivet steel, floor after floor. High-speed elevators spring through the cores. Planes soar over them all. Wall Street is wing walking. Call it barnstormer capitalism. Soon the bankers and the brokers will steal the aviator's lexicon, claim their own tailspins, nosedives, crack ups, graph their own doomsday cycles, wonder how everything blue sky stayed up so long. Exuberance buys more stock on margin, volume runs high, the ticker tape can't keep up, higher. Higher. That's it. Bravo, <laughs> bravo. Um, all right. You have given us so much to think about. It's time for questions from the audience. Uh, shall we start with, we we've, have we've a microphone available for folks in the audience, and then Eileen will be moderating, uh, delivering some questions from online. But let's, let's start. Uh, 
with someone in the audience. And please do talk right into the microphone. Um, Hi there. It's Lori Gold, and it was a pleasure meeting you at Cocktail Hour. Um, from a fellow Seven Sister, which we didn't talk about earlier. My question has to do, and I guess I'll, I'll put out some pieces that you had put out earlier, and then ask my question. You spoke of um, the barnstormers as the framers of, um, let's see if I can read my handwriting, tail spins and crashing for the depression. You spoke about Phyllis Schlafly, who was able to take a breath and frame a strategy for anti-women and anti-human beings, I would guess. Um, in, after the 2000 election, as a politico myself, in interest and in avocation, we saw that there was a reframing of the debate that became a popular topic after Bush v. Gore. And my question is, um, if you were to start today, I know there's a ton of history and we all came from it and it's wonderful. And you brought an historic perspective, you brought an urban perspective, you brought an analysis of what could have gone right and what didn't go right, and in some cases, what did go right. But if we were looking forward into the social versus the product services, or social services versus products like childcare, senior care, et cetera, um, I guess the two things are, looking at spaces and design, economics and climate issue, and anything else you want to bring in, what would be the equation that you would advocate for? And what would be the strategy? Because all of these reframers didn't do it yesterday. They all did it from a longer term perspective, which emerged almost overnight. So what would be that strategy? And then what would be the equation to value services and as a caregiver to a 93 year old I appreciate where you came from with that a lot thank you well that's a very complicated question if you're asking for an economic evaluation of the importance of care work but there are several women economists who've taken that one on and there are some very uh, notable books uh, by people like uh, Nancy Fulbray, and uh, I do rec I recommend you look into the people who have uh, spent a lot of their careers as economists uh, investigating the importance and value of care work. Uh, should we go alternate with online, or are we? Yes, we have a question all the way from Italy. This listener was very impressed by public transportation in Italy via train, streetcar, and bus. And she would like to hear Dolores' opinion on the role of public transportation in facilitating a more humane community. Well, of course, the important nature of public transportation is that it takes people where they need to go and not just one at a time or maybe two at a time. You know, the private car is relatively inefficient. If there is a um, sense that many European cities are more concentrated and dense and have always spent more on public transportation than the United States and they've taken better care of the systems that they have. So. I'm not sure I can really answer a question that comes from Italy about um, ways to do this better. In the United States, uh, we, are, we are struggling with those questions, and there are certainly some people who believe that public transportation is not a good uh, investment 
because they seem to feel that we just owe our, owe our, owe our loyalty to the auto industry in its various forms. Well, but you might talk a little about the ways in which, especially we do see in Europe, more attention to, for instance, how does that stroller and yes. with a small child get onto the bus? Yes. How do the bus stops actually provide places for folks who might be in wheelchairs or um, and, and just access even to the bus stops often if you're not older, younger, all of those things. I mean, Europe's been doing yes. quite a lot. Yes, with and putting the bus stops in safe locations because often time when women are most vulnerable can be when they're waiting to travel on public transportation or traveling on mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I think there was a question right at the back there. Yes. Hand went up early. Hi, this is terrific. My name is Four. Um, I have been thinking about a couple phrases a lot lately to help me think about, look at <clears throat> the world we're in, uh, why it's the way we are, and how it might be different. Uh, and I'll just quote them so I get them right. Um, Other countries have social safety nets. The U.S. has women. This is uh, Jessica Caralco, who's in Department of Sociology in, in U. Indiana. And part of the problem <clears throat> is that, in, uh, she means in the U.S. social structure, women are the backup for everything. Uh, which certainly in my, my own life I see. So how do, if, if there's something valid to these, uh, how do we think about architecture in terms of these statements or assessments of the structure of the society we're in? Thank you. Well, I guess it, it might be useful to distinguish between all aspects of the built environment you know, housing, um, urban space, and then to think about uh, how you might define architecture. And I would prefer the most inclusive definition of the built environment and the, ent the world that's been shaped, the natural landscape, the uh, built landscape, and everything that we might call our cultural landscape and to think about ways that all kinds of stereotypes about public and private um, then affect the lives of men, women, and children. And if you begin to think spatially, you also see the many ways you know, that race was an extreme uh, spatial divider. Neighborhoods were redlined. People couldn't get mortgages. Other neighborhoods were classified as positive places where you could invest, people could get mortgages. There's very strong work being done around race and space right now and housing. Um, and I think that you can also see that that can apply to gender, ways in which women were not allowed to get mortgages, couldn't own houses, couldn't, couldn't necessarily get um, even leases were more often evicted. All the ways that this makes your life very tenuous and uncertain. And if at the same time women are the backups for children or for the elderly or perhaps for the men in their households and the fact that they are often um, not in a particularly strong position vis-a-vis -vis housing makes it even harder now, I would also add to that. I mean, I think one could have a different answer to that question if one was talking about architecture as a profession. And how, I mean, it's interesting. I'll piggyback on your question and toss to you, yes. Dolores. I mean, as the profession itself has become more diverse mm -hmm. than it was when you or I were in school, um, do you think it is really changing? Is there more attention to those issues of care, especially the issues of care? Do you, you said you were going to, you were seeing it in a, a number of different I'm, classes and studio in schools. And, yes. So uh, I mentioned four different studios. I was invited to uh, talk to the students, and I'm not sure whether it's significant or not, but they were all headed by 
women architects and three of them international. So they're teaching in the US, but they are international in their uh, own practices. Yeah. Interesting. All right, let, should we go, any, is there another question online? Yes, uh, one of our audience members has noticed a lot of invisibility toward rural areas in architectural discourse and believes this reinforces some of those stereotypes of whose work and buildings are important. She would like to hear Dolores' thoughts on the rural context. It's tremendously important, of course. And when you're in a rural context, uh, there's less density, uh, so it becomes more difficult to find the services you might need. You're not necessarily going to find elderly care and child care close to where you're living. And the pressures then on rural, rural towns are maybe even higher than they would be on city neighborhoods. All right, let's get to another question from the audience in front of us. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for connecting the dots between gender bias and the urban infrastructure and infrastructure in general. That was really an eye opener for me. Uh, there is, as you pointed out, a very high social price tag on these biases. Did you ever evaluate the a price tag on the ecological consequences for sprawling out. For instance, when we are visiting friends in West Virginia or Pennsylvania, going through the countryside and seeing Mac mansions on 10 acres of land and all that is around it is mowed lawn, I think it is a horrible thing. Thank you. Well, there's certainly many uh, people in the landscape field who would agree that 10 acres of mowed lawn would be um, inappropriate. And then, of course, we are saying that as the houses get bigger and bigger and the households get smaller, there's a great mismatch between the way Americans have been using their housing resources. And of course, the biggest mortgage subsidies went to the people with the largest mortgages rather than the people who needed those subsidies. Um, for quite a while, it was um, even possible to get that subsidy on your second home, not just your first. I believe that's no longer the case. But we put all of our housing subsidies at the McMansion end and very few at the, at the end of the people who needed it, who were small um, first-time homeowners or even renters. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, do we have an online? Yes, one of our uh, audience members online is wondering Dolores's opinion on how technology such as dishwashers, microwaves, and online shopping may have helped address the need for care services. Well, when I was working on Grand Domestic Revolution, I knew quite a few people working on feminist analysis of household technology. And one of the interesting Examples was the washing machine. People wanted washing machines, but after they got the washing machines, the number of hours spent on laundry were not necessarily decreased because people had more clothes and they wanted them cleaner. That would not necessarily hold true in every society around the world, but I think it probably is correct for middle class Americans in, you know, in the 50s. Um, Technology always has to be looked at very carefully to see whether, whether um, the promises that advertisers make are really ever delivered. And then the question about whether these things should be individual or collective and how complicated, how complicated that may be. Mm -hmm. Well, before um, I'm going to, I return the floor to Eileen Fuchs. I'm a professor like Dolores, so I'm going to give, I want to give everyone a little homework. Over the course of the next few hours, ponder a question that Dolores posed as the title to an article that she wrote in 1979 
the, the really before um, most of the books. And the question, I think it's so pertinent to everything we've been talking about tonight, issues of caring, issues of feminism, issues of workers. What would a non-sexist city be like? And if you want to read her answer, you can Google it online. And it kind of helps if you have a university access to get, the, get copies. But um, I just want to leave everybody with, with that question. Talk amongst yourselves. And I'm gonna, with that, um, thank you, Dolores. And I'm going to uh, invite Eileen to come back up. Shall we do a couple hours of breakout groups now? We're just going to break out. We'll, 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 we'll conclude at 4 a.m. That's a really hard transition to make. Um, that was, that was an incredible program. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all so much tonight for joining us online and in person. And we do invite you to go to the museum store where we have signed copies of three of Dolores' books. So make sure to check that out. And with that, thanks for joining us at the National Building Museum. Have a wonderful evening.